Hello and welcome. This is the Brooklyn Rails 951st New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, a programs associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Bethany Collins and Amanda Glivizzi. We are thrilled to welcome poet Riel Bello here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we're speaking from. And now to introduce today's guest and host, Bethany Collins was born in Montgomery, Alabama and lives and works in Chicago, Illinois. Collins is a multidisciplinary artist whose conceptual practice examines the relationship between race and language. Centering language, its biases, contradictions, and ability to simultaneously forge connect connections and foster violence, her works illuminate America's past and offer insight into the development of racial and national identities. Our host today, formerly associate professor at Ohio State University, Amanda Glibizzi, is the founding co-director of the New Foundation for Art History and art scene editor for the Brooklyn Rail. She specializes in mid and late 20th century art, design and urbanism in the United States, Europe and Latin America. Amanda is the author of Art and Design in 1960s New York from Anthem Press. Thanks to you all so much for joining today. I'll turn it over to Amanda. Hi everyone, thank you so much, Carolyn. And um, thank you everyone for being here. We're so excited to welcome Bethany Collins today. Um, Hers is a practice that I was not totally familiar with before I was able to go and see this remarkable show at Alexander Gray. And so I'm so excited to get to know her and her work better and, and to speak with all of you about it today. Um, Bethany has had a, an amazing couple of years. Um, she's won several awards. She has multiple solo shows going on right now. And so first of all, I just wanna say, Bethany, congratulations. This is such a wonderful year for you. Oh, and you know what, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so congratulations again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that you have at least two solo shows happening right now. Um, one at Alexander Gray and one at the Peabody Essex. Is that right? Yes. Um, and so can you tell us just to get started um, with our familiarity with your practice? How, how do they talk to each other? How are they the same? How are they different? How did you go about conceptualizing having two shows in two different venues that are actually asking different things for different audiences. Um, walk us through that. I mean, I think all the shows of the last few years, they're thematically, they're thematic cousins. They're very much related. Everything that's coming after 2016 is a actually a response to that post-election moment. Um, initially, I was reading a lot of, all my work is language-based. So I was reading a lot of um, post-apocalyptic texts, looking for the language of the end of things, you know, you don't, I don't think we understand something until we have named it. And so I needed someone else to give me the language for a world you thought you knew has ended what comes after, because we're still here. Um, and after like a lot of post-apocalyptic dystopian literature fiction, which everybody else was reading too, I eventually came to Emily Wilson's translation of the Odyssey of all things. You had a beautiful I am reading interview. that right now. I'm yes. so excited. Okay. <laughs> it's the best translation, arguably best. She's also the first woman to translate it into English, which might be why it's the best. Um, but this, you know, this ancient text of exile and homecoming and feeling a kind of strangeness among the people who should feel the most familiar to you, all of that, that became a kind of metaphor for that post-election moment. And everything, the Peabody Essex show, the Alexander Gray show, everything has emerged from there. Um, it, that, this, my series then, the Odyssey series, I'm focusing only on book 13. And the Odyssey is not in either of those shows, but I think it's the kind of origin series for everything that comes after. 
So there's a moment in book 13 then when Odysseus, after 10 years at war, and then 10 years weeping on every wrong shoreline he lands upon, it's a very wordy text, he finally stands on the shoreline of his own country, looks around, and doesn't recognize the place. And that that metaphor, that was the metaphor for that moment when your homeland can feel simultaneously familiar and estranging was a kind of balm. Um, and that balm carried me for, for several years, but every series, all of the work also has a kind of natural death embedded within it. It can only go so far. If I'm only looking at book 13, there are only so many works to be made. And so what came after, which is at the heart of the Alexander Gray show, is the Antigone series. And what came after, which is at the heart of the Peabody Essex show, is America a Hymnal, which is a hundred different versions of my country, Tis of Thee, forever bound together. Everything, though, is still a response to that moment. And when I know um, to this question of, like, how do you work on multiple things at the same time? When I know a series is, I can just kind of see its death on the horizon, I immediately start thinking of, I need, I prepare, I prepare for the death. And so Antigone, going back to the Alexander Gray, Antigone is unlike Odysseus, you know, Odysseus sucks up all the oxygen in the room, he is the complicated hero, whose choices are the result of all of the death of his men. Antigone's choices are so much, I mean, smaller. I mentioned this to Catherine Lord, and she said maybe smaller is not the right word, but they're contained. Her choice to bury her kin is, um, what do you do in the aftermath of war when we're no longer concerned with that immediate crisis? How do you go on? Her choice then becomes the heart of undercurrents, I think, yeah a long-winded answer to that question. Mm -hmm. And if you don't mind me asking, when you realize that you're coming to the death of one of your series, do you mourn? I get nervous um, and anxious. I like, I like the moment when all of the work is clear. I know the direction, like I go into my studio and I know what I will labor on today. But not knowing the text that I need to grapple with is the most anxiety inducing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I know it's Odysseus, I'm okay. And when I know it's the Lost Friend series, I am well. Because <laughs> I can just live and struggle with that text and the duality and contradictions within, within that world of the, of the text. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but not knowing the uncertainty is what makes me incredibly un unpleasant. <laughs> I have a hard time believing that actually. <laughs> um, when you when you begin something, it makes sense that you know that it might end. Um, but do you know how big it will be, or are you kind of feeling your way as you go? I didn't know that the Odyssey would last me this long. Um when I used to give talks, I would always mention the first lines of Emily Wilson's translation, which, you know, the New Yorker mentions has been translated like 36 different ways. That, that's too tantalizing for me not to make a work about because I'm always interested in the capacity of language, that if we could just find the right word, the right translation, that there is nothing we could not communicate about. And then also that language as a very human endeavor is also bound to fail. It's not always, it's imperfect. Mm -hmm. So it has these beautiful capacities and inherent failure and I'm always working between them. So the Odyssey was too tempting not to, to, to grapple with, but I used to mention in talks, one of the first lines that I would cite is her translation of that first, first couple sentences, first stanza of the Odyssey. Just tell me about a complicated man, Muse. Tell me how he wandered and was lost and tell the old story for our modern times, find the beginning. And usually when I would recite that in a talk, it would catch in my throat, which is how, and I don't know if anybody else picked up on it, but I always knew that I needed a moment because the text was still very much alive for me. That metaphor was still acting as a kind of balm for, for myself. Um, when it stopped catching, I knew it was done. I understood something. And when you understand it completely enough to like fluently articulate it, the work is done. It has lives for others, but the work for me is over. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's such an interesting way of thinking about it. Um, it's it's like you are on your own odyssey and, and to make a totally obvious metaphor here. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so you kind of like came home, but it was like a different home for you as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. And then I immediately started looking for what are the, what are the smaller text? Because it was not just the Odyssey that I'd been grappling with. It was the Odyssey and then the Aeneid and then our national hymns, the Star Spangled Banner, My Country, Tis of Thee, the big texts, the ones that are supposed to, to carry us through the crisis, the ones we're supposed to turn to in the midst of things. But you know, like Odysseus, they suck up all the oxygen. They are the epics. And Antigone's descent, like I mentioned, is a contained choice. The world is is smaller there. The consequences of her actions feel they are hers, you know, for family, for ritual, for mourning, and to go on, to, to make the right choice, even when the maybe it will have no further impact beyond yourself to go on. Mm-hmm. The Lost Friends ads, I think, are the same. It's um the Lost Friends series are the Black Embossed Works. And Heather A. Williams has a really beautiful text about this, um, these classified ads called Can You Help Me to Find My People? They're ads that are placed by formerly enslaved people shortly before the end of emancipation all the way up until the 1920s, looking for their loved ones. And people would post um, everything they could remember about their loved one. So multiple names, but nicknames, names only you would know or someone else, where they lived, masters, plantations, any identifying marks. And then they would ask this question of longing. Have you seen her? Can you help me to find my people? I am all alone in the world over and over again. But there you know, thinking about what comes after the epics, there is a link between Antigone and the Lost Friends. They are entirely different centuries and different people, different circumstances, but they're both happening in the aftermath of civil war. And both of them are choices for a kind of faith in reunification or a faith in ritual. You do it anyway. You know, a lot of those ads were Some were posted every year, but a lot of them were just one-offs, shots in the dark in the hope of finding your kin. They Um, all didn't work, and yet you still, the choice is the same. Right. Carolyn, can you go to slide 19 just so that we can get a a sense of what they might look like a little closer up? Um, It's interesting that you say shots in the dark, of course, because that seems almost like you're you're describing like doing a a formal analysis of these. Um, And so what we're looking at here are these really, really beautiful matte black sheets of paper um, that have the embossed lettering of these these ads placed in them. And for the most part, they're illegible. Um, or at least they were to me. Um, I had to like pull out my reading glasses and everything and was like, you know, like trying to get the the light exactly right and stuff like that. And so it was kind of curious about that too, um, about the the way that these are somehow legible, but mostly illegible. Um, and And how we might think about that as a metaphor for the experience that the people who place these ads were going through. So the work, they're blind embossed onto this matte black Stonehenge paper. And then blind embossing, of course, this um, engraving. There is a church in Philadelphia, Mother Bethel, and a couple of colleges that are digitizing a lot of these ads. So the notices were placed in African American newspapers across the across the country, but mostly you know north to northeast, south to northeast. Um, and so the digitization makes it a little easier to to search for the chorus of questions. There is always something linking multiple ads together. Sometimes it is the question, "Can you help me to find my people?" And multiple people are asking it in their ads from different years, different places. In these works, the recurring phrase, the chorus is the years of separation. How long has it been since you've seen your kin? But then the embossing takes those digitized ads and engraves it into acrylic plates backwards. You soak the paper, you run it through the press and it's a tremendous amount of pressure that then forces 
that malleable soaked paper into the grooves of the plate. When you lift it up, it's kind of like a braille. To me, that, you know, the pressure is important, that it's only created through a lot of, um, through a exertion of the body and the, and the press, but also that the, that they're not easy to read, you know, so there's something about transferring this problem of the text or the, the painfulness and the painful nature of the text onto the viewer, that if you really want to read it, then you have to do the work of understanding it. They're mm -hmm. legible, but they're hard. They're hard on the eyes yeah. and all of that's intentional. Yeah. I don't want it to be easy. Sometimes, um, you know, places that are going to show the works, they'll ask for transcriptions, which I always resist because it makes the work, the work is to transfer whatever frustration with language or the time for me back onto the viewer. It's no longer mine. It's now yours. And what we do with it. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that's the right decision. Absolutely. I feel like you have to work for this and to make it easy would be then to to refuse to understand the struggle that is behind these things. Mm -hmm. um, do you see them, they're obviously works on paper, but do you see them as objects as well? Do you see them mostly as text? How do you, how do you envision them as art objects? They come, I mean, this is a practical decision. They always come framed. They can't be framed a different way so that the, I mean, this is always a choice within the work. I want to be in charge of everything. Um, that struggling with language is in part in order to be kind of master of it by the end of the struggle that I, I get it. So I make all the choices. But then also, I mean, any other frame, they're partly object, any other frame, and they wouldn't suck the light into themselves. Mm -hmm. you know, any other mat, and they would repel you. I did another uh, work around the, a pattern or practice. It's um, a blind embossing of the Ferguson report. It's blindingly white. So it is Somerset radiant white paper. It's unframed. So they float and different than these where you have to get close to them. The white just, you know, that it bounces off, off the room, off the paper. It's I think creates a kind of desire, like you long to be close and understand them. You are also forbidden from touching them. Mm -hmm. And that white bouncing off your eyes is, it's painful. It actually hurts to read them, which is another kind of, it's the same thing as here, but just in different form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there's something too so important about these that it kind of, they do absorb light and so almost like kill light. Um, and that felt too so vital to the experience of of attempting to read them, of attempting to look at them, of attempting to try to understand what's going on. You know that that they are actually like um, acting almost like as black holes or something, where where they're actually like kind of sucking all of that into themselves. And so they're both um, blank and replete at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, I think they do, yes. And I think they they do something that Catherine was mentioning to me when I um when I said that these are all kind of smaller acts, they're not the epics, they're not Odysseus, they're smaller acts of resistance. But I think maybe part of the show is to is to make monumental what seems quite small. Like Odysseus, uh, Antigone's descent feels like a very self-contained thing that has not these repercussions like the Odyssey. And yet if I if I can highlight them through this process, if I can make these blind embossed works on a certain kind of black paper that holds everything unto themselves, that you cannot escape the kind of elevation of them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It yeah. does. I think it's so important too that um, in order to to try to comprehend them, we have to lean into them. We really do have to um, to contort ourselves in order to understand them according to their instructions. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that they 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 have this very very powerful 
wall presence that I thought was just so striking in the gallery. So when we think too about legibility and illegibility, this feels of course like a through line in your practice because the Antigone works also um, are mostly illegible. Um, they do have moments that are very striking where, where we can read what's in front of us. But for the most part, it would be very, very difficult to, to understand what we're looking at. And so I'm curious about this too, about this idea of um, illegibility as a medium almost for you. Mm -hmm. So these are, um... These are translations of Antigone. There's always at least two being compared. This again, started with the Odyssey. Um, that first moment that I focused on in book 13, when Odysseus looks out at the water, there's at least 10 different ways that the translation of what the water was doing that have been transcribed. And you would think after, you know, 60 some translations into English, 400 years into English, we would at least know what the water was doing. And we don't, mm -hmm. there is no agreement in the text. It was whispering or tumultuous or deaf resounding or booming. There is no agreement in the text it comes from the same Greek origin text. And yet it's, it is a kind of revealing of the hand of the translator, the time that they lived in the person that is translating all these things. And so at least two translations always are compared. That text then is transcribed, sometimes photo transferred, sometimes, sometimes screen printed in graphite onto the page. Then I always handwrite over that in graphite as well to make it mine and to insert myself into the text and then use a bit of spit to erase. And so what looks like illegibility is actually the text being kind of eaten away by spit, saliva, and a pink pearl eraser, sometimes black magic eraser, mostly pink pearl. And then what remains are those comparing translations. So in this case, maybe it's hard to see what remains. It's from the same origin text, Athenian Greek, but what remains from 2004 is it starts like an undulation underwater, a surge that hauls black sand up off the bottom, then turns itself into a tidal current, lashing the shingle and shaking promontories. In 2015, that shifts. It comes rolling the black night silt up from the ocean floor and all your thrash coasts groan. What's interesting is in the Homeric Greek, there's often a lot more contradictions within the text. The water is whispering or it is booming and yelling. And in the Athenian Greek, it's just... There's less contradiction. There's just like, let me say it a different way. And here's another way. But I don't, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I don't think of the erasure as a kind of redaction. I think it's just, um, maybe it's an insertion of my own hand as translator. Mm -hmm. Let me show you these. I just want to highlight this one little moment mm -hmm. where something that the language does not align and within that space, I mean, that's, yeah, within that space is the entire reason that I make. It's the duality of language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that really struck me looking at these in person is that we have um, the the detritus for the, from the act of your hand at the bottom of the frame. So um, these pieces of paper are mounted within the frame and they have glass over them. And then at the bottom edge of the frame are all of these, I'm gonna call them shavings for lack of a better word, um, which I think is so interesting, this idea that it's actually um, the very act of crumbling this paper winds up falling within the work of art itself and then gets saved. Um, it's not swept out of your studio and thrown away, but rather is, is kept there as almost uh, like a memento or something like that. And so I was so interested in this. It's both evidence of your hand, but it's also something else. It's 
um, evidence of maybe compassion. And so I, I would love for you to talk about that too. I can, but then I'm really interested in what you mean by compassion. Um, I would love to, I would love to know that. <clears throat> I used to spray these works with a little bit of uh, archival adhesive. You know, I've been working on the erasure series for a long time, starting with contronyms. These are words that contain their own opposite meanings. Mm -hmm. I love those. <laughs> I love that. There's 88, I think, in, in English. They exist in other languages, but it's, you know, I'm monolingual, so it's hard for me to find the poetry. I'd have to mm -hmm. run out somewhere else. Quiddity is still my favorite, though. Quiddity means the essence of something and a trifling nothing. It's like everything and it is nothing. So they're words that over time have evolved to abide their own contradiction or contain their own contradiction. I love this idea. So I started the erasure, this kind of process with that series. And I used to spray a little bit of fixative, fixative and adhesive on top so that once they're erased, they will remain. I stopped doing that with the Odyssey because the whole point of the work is that language will not rest. If it's a reflection of us, paper and language as reflections of the body and life and human form. And if my whole intent is that there's no, that, that language refuses to settle, then the language should continue to move. Every time these works are moved, a little bit more will rain down. And it will rest in the bottom as a kind of, mm, a kind of, what's the word? Something not ceremonial, but something of mourning in the bottom. Like there's something gone, but also kept forever. The residue is still there. Mm -hmm. One of our, um, our wonderful participants, GE, says that um, it's an act of reverence and, and he writes that it makes them into reliquaries, which is such a wonderful way of thinking about it. Um, when I was thinking about compassion, yeah, I mean, I think it's so easy to say that something um, shows empathy. And so I'm suspicious of that. Um, but I think that if we think about compassion, perhaps as something that also exhibits gentleness mm -hmm. after strife. Um, and so I think that might be where I, I'm coming in on this is that clearly there is, um, if not violence, then action being taken with these works of art. You have to manipulate them. Um, pretty rigorously in order to create them. But then at the end, they, they aren't then just left on their own. Um, you know, they are, they are bundled and cared for and shown gentleness. Um, and so there is a way then of, of demonstrating care for them in a really wonderful way that I think is incredibly moving. I like that. Mm -hmm. There's a, um, um, go ahead, go ahead. No, there's a, a different series that's not here. It's related to the blind embossed works, the lost friends. But for a few of them, I blind embossed them on this red, more fragile, acid free newsprint. So it's much thinner than the Stonehenge. And then I embossed them twice. And so the soaking, bossing, re registering, soaking, bossing, all of that gets happens twice. I made those after the family separation crisis at the border. So this looking for your family and the separation of, of families as a kind of um, an act of retribution or um, maybe prevent punitive kind of control, something that we have done before and that we do again and again, it shows up in the paper itself. That second embossing, the paper starts to fall apart like the residue. But what I also like about both of these works is never does the erasure go completely through. Never does the paper, like once it dries for those twice embossed works, they seal themselves. They are witness and they show the evidence of what has happened to them. And also they're stronger than they look. And I think there's um, mm. a resonance between both those kind of residue that's worn on the surface. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that is such an interesting way of putting it because I think then of these as being almost like a body 
um, and the way that, for example, a scar shows past evidence of harm, but also is a form of self-healing. Yeah, I've been working with a stone carver for a future project that then led to these cast paperworks. Um, our concerns are very different. Stone carvers are rightly concerned with permanence. They have to be. I've never thought about permanence. Nothing about language or the body lends itself to the forever and the eternal ever. Um, I, you know, my choice of paper is about it's fragile. It will only last so long. It will show everything that has been done to it and stone less so, you know, mm -hmm. It'll take a few hundred, hundred years before the stone shows the wear of its life. Paper is like us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very true. That's very true. Um, if I'm thinking about stone, then I think it makes sense that we we talk about the, the stone works that are in this show. Um, let me see. Carolyn, can you find them right away or do you need me to give you a number? There's perfect. Um, so first, these are called old ship. So can you tell um, our participants a little bit about the title of them and, and what the backstory is here? Yes. So I'm working with um, Stone Carver in South Carolina on a project for 2025 that's for Laxart Mocha LA, future project, recarving the granite base of the Stonewall Jackson monument that came down. It's a pink, is it a westerly granite? It's this if you lick it and put a little spit on it, it turns pink, but it's a bit gray just when it's dried. So I'm recarving that for a future project and the dust that's being cast off from that carving and all of the testing I'm saving in order to cast into these separate then works. So I worked with Judene to create these um, handmade cast paper works that are equal to me, they're equal parts paper cotton and granite, Confederate granite. So the shape of these, and these also make me nervous because they don't have anything to do with language, at least not on their surface. Mm -hmm. um, the shape comes from the oldest black church in Montgomery, Alabama, which is my hometown. The sanctuary is surrounded by 12 columns. And on top of them, there's these very ornate um, cornices surrounded by acanthus leaves. And so I created 12 of these cast paper works and slightly different, you know, mixing in that granite shifts the color and the texture, how much they fall apart um, and how much, um, when I did a walkthrough for the show, someone said it actually looked like bone mixed into that, that kind of the bodiliness of them shifts depending on the amount of granite. But the idea for the works is that Old Ship, AME Zion is the church and it's one of 35 black churches to receive national federal preservation grants last year. Mm -hmm. So in the demolition of one monument, which is akin to this, um, what is that term? Demnatio memori, when the, this Roman idea that you cannot let the image of a traitor that definition is, is shaky there, but the definition, but the image of a traitor exists on the landscape and yet we have. So the demolition of that image could make room for the elevation of another and the preservation of another. Old Ship is one of its oldest black church. It's also really key to the civil rights movement. It is a site of community care to take care of your people. Um, and I like this idea that Stonewall's demise makes room for the monumentality of another thing. But monumentality is tricky because, again, I'm not a stone carver and I'm not interested in permanence. These also have a kind of, you know, the, the fragility of them is much more akin to the body than granite is, pure granite. Um, it's it's so interesting that you say that if you licked the stone that it would become kind of pink because it is true that looking at each of them separately in the gallery, they do have distinct hues on their own. And so even though if you were to look at them just very casually, you would think that maybe they were identical. In fact, they each have their own personality and, um, you know, I don't know what to say, um, that they have their own profile. I guess I would say. 
Um, I was telling you earlier that I was really struck by them because the evidence of the hand is so clear here, um, which you wouldn't necessarily think of in terms of casting, um, because of course the, the way that a casting process works, you have to work with something that existed before. Um, so presumably some sort of mold or something like that. Um, but I was really struck by the acanthus leaves and the way that it seemed almost like your fingers were kind of raking through them. And um, so I was I was very curious about that too. Um, how much did you did you get your hand in here? And um, how did it feel to to like dig into this material? So I worked at the Dudenay uh, in Brooklyn on these and. Um, I've never done casting or paper making before. It was a surprisingly laborious process. I mean, it's everything that I usually look for. It's repetitive. It is labor intensive. Mm -hmm. I like to find meaning by doing the same thing over and over and over again. I didn't think that it would be painful though. I thought like, oh, okay, I'm going to escape that um, rule mm -hmm. for myself this time. And I didn't this, I think this was two days to create the 12 for the surrounding columns. It took two days at the studio. And the third day I went to reach for my coffee cup and my hand was just like spasmed out. I had to go and, you know, wow. it really, really hurt for like a week after that it surprised me. I mean, usually that means you're not doing it right, but, um, I think it's also, <laughs> yeah, it usually means I'm not doing something right, but, um, but I'm like, oh no, not the coffee. <laughs> it was, it was my co first cup of coffee in the morning. It's like, oh, I can't hold it. <laughs> no. A horror. Um, I was like, I forgot what I was going to say. I like this idea that there's something about how do you make, especially when language isn't there, how do I still know that my, myself is in the work? Mm -hmm. A lot of times that and also because a lot of times the work is abstract, I need some sort of limitation to know when it ends, a kind of self-imposed death again to the work. And a lot of times that has been, I'll do it until my hand hurts. And it happened this way too for these. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's just so fascinating to me because consistently your work has been described as a conceptual process so we don't often think then about the body as being very involved in a conceptual process. And, and yet your body is so fully present here. And of course, then you, you manipulate us too and, and make our bodies present in this work as well. Um, there's a way that um, I, I think about this, this phrase from the seventies, right? The mind is, is a muscle. Um, and so we're, we're actually like fully part of the concept. Then it is a full body experience, not just a, a mindful process, but a bodily process as well. Do you know, um, I'll say this with preface, there's a really beautiful Teju Cole interview with Krista Tippett where he talks, this is the preface, where he talks about leaving behind the credo belief of his childhood. And yet he still looks to these essential texts like poetry and literature and Homer, specifically the Odyssey, he still needs those. I have also, you know, I grew up in Alabama in the deep South. So I grew up in the church. I have left behind the credo belief of my childhood. But I think some of those rituals without the to uh, theology behind them, I still turn to the rituals. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in a um, evangelical church first where you like faith is faith must be shown. You show it in the body, you show it in order to, to really like claim belief. And then in a Presbyterian church who shows nothing, you barely clap when the choir is singing, you know, it's an intellectual grappling with the word. And I think both of those, you know, though I have left behind the credo belief, both of those turnings, you know, struggling with language, ways of struggling, I need, I like both of them to make sense. Yeah. Um, Carolyn, can you go back one to the, to the round work? Um, because this is perfect for this. Um, 
these are um, these circular works uh, that just looking at them immediately could look like an eye or could also look like um, a mandala. Um, they could actually suggest some sort of ritual practice. If you were, in fact, tr to try to read the music, you would have to turn them. And so then you would have to actually like enact some sort of bodily awareness of these pieces. Um, and I was just reading last night that these are actually based on the visuality of, of Haydn and, and his Ten Commandments, which I knew the work, but did not know the visual aspect of the work. So um, this like, just totally blew my mind. So, so tell us about um, what these are and how they came about for you. So these are musical scores that are based on contrafacta, kind of like contronyms. Contrafacta are songs that retain the same melody, the Bonnie Blue Flag here, but then the lyrics are rewritten for different political causes. So My Country Tis of Thee is another that's at the Peabody Essex that I made the hymnal for. There are at least a hundred different versions of My Country Tis of Thee that are written for native sovereignty, revolution, suffrage, temperance, prohibition, lots of prohibition, abolition, the Confederacy, often in contradiction to one another. What unites them is the tune stays the same, melody consistent, but, um, the lyrics shift over time, like the translation to constantly rewritten. So the Bonnie Blue Flag is an 1861 Confederate marching song. It's not, you know, undercurrents. It's not the dominant song at the time. That's Dixie. Bonnie Blue Flag is like runner up to that, but it is Confederate. And then the song gets rewritten by, there's like, I found a suffrage version, uh, maybe two suffrage versions, and then a bunch of union versions, which are all the works in the show. Like you should sing the song to the, it's it's intended, written to be sung to the Confederacy and the union takes it over and tries its best to change the, change the meaning of it. Then I worked with a composer in Philly, Peter Christian, who's a really lovely composer because I do not read music and music is not my language. Um, to transpose that initial Bonnie Blue Flag score into circular form like Haydn's, to make it from, take it from major F into a minor key. And then the only other instructions I gave was that I want it to be as stormy and chaotic as possible. And his translation of that was the, to make the innermost circle into a minor key passagalia where that baseline is just constantly descending. He actually sent me a clip of it um, that I feel like could be its own work, own audio work, but it's a polytonal canon. So there's about six voices and it's constantly repeating and constantly descending. It almost feels like it's the descent into, into hell. That's the initial idea. And then on top of those drawings of the scores and the lyrical stanza shifts at the bottom, are drawings of tear gas from the summer of 2020 protest. I pulled images for particularly for these, something really quirky, kind of stupid actually about the Bonnie Blue flag is that it was in, it's written so that you can learn the states of secession in order. It's a kind of history lesson for the Confederacy. And so the first state to secede is South Carolina. So I'm looking at images from the state newspaper in South Carolina from 2020 to, to redraw those drawings, the tear gas that's deployed against protesters. I think these works then are doing what I hope showing Antigone and Lost Friends together does, which is to collapse the time between them. Different people, different, all different. And yet same thing over and over again, we return. Yeah, I think they're kind of, they're haunting. Both that audio piece, listening to this score, it's haunting, mm -hmm. it's creepy. And the conflation of time periods of centuries that there is a link between them and there's a a kind of chorus over and over again between them that you cannot escape or that one is not explicable without the other. Mm -hmm. it, it, it puts me back in the time of 2020 and um, thinking about the protests and of course thinking about George Floyd and, and all of the the actions that led to the protests and um, 
I, we were locked down because we had a very small child at the time. And so we, we weren't leaving our house at all. And I just remember thinking, um, this is the eternal return. Um, why do we keep coming back to this? And, you know, the, the frustration um, that I felt that I can only imagine everybody else felt, even though I wasn't seeing anybody else. I, I just had this feeling that like we were in a loop and somehow couldn't get out of. And so I'm very curious about this idea of the, the contrafactum and the way that perhaps if we change the words, maybe we can get out of the loop. Um, what do you think? Is, is this a way of resisting the, the eternal return? Hmm. I think two things. I think ooh, I, Isabel Wilkerson's um, relative, still new book cast in the introduction. She talks about America as a very old house and it has really good curb appeal, but then you do your inspections in the basement and realize there's this really large fissure crack in the foundation. What I, what I hope that the work is doing, something I rarely say about hoping for the work, what I hope the work is doing is showing that kind of chorus over time. It's not mm -hmm. the same circumstance. We are capable of choosing very differently but here we are again, and here we are again. Um, so I hope that it points out that kind of, we should know that this is not a new moment, that it's like threads, the tentacles of it can be traced back very, very easily, actually. It didn't, that it didn't come out of nowhere. Yeah. So that's not a, that's not a circle. That's like, oh, here's, here are yeah. the origins. And there's something really helpful about knowing the origins of a, of a nightmare. Mm. Helpful. But the other thing is the question I often get during the, after giving a talk sometime during the Q and a is like, what do you want people to get from the work? I have no idea. No <laughs> idea. I make it for myself. I make it because something I don't understand mm -hmm. and I will not understand it until I have the words for it. Yeah. I have to then work this, it's the work of it that gives me the language of the end of the world or the bomb or the aftermath, whatever. So I don't know what I want people to get from it. I think I just, no idea, but I, that, that also, I don't think is my, is my work. That's not my job. Yeah. My okay. job is to ask the question, oh, here we are again. Are we going to do this again? Mm -hmm. And I can't answer that. The work is asking, but I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. it's very similar to the blind embossed, the red ones that fall apart. Oh, we're doing this again. Are we going to make the exact same choices? We did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. It's, very cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's not your fault. <laughs> um, I, I think that I want to end with the, what I told you would be my last question. Um, when we read Greek tragedies, but other tragedies as well. For me, most recently, it was King Lear, um, watching a particular performance of King Lear and realizing that I was like sobbing without even realizing that I was sobbing. One of the points for the Greeks of tragedy is to experience catharsis. Mm -hmm. And it's important for the Greeks that we are able to experience catharsis because otherwise we, we have no options at all, right? Um, we're not just then stuck in a moment where the gods have control over us, but we're actually stuck in a moment where our lives and, and everything else have control over us. And so catharsis then permits us to have a moment at least of relief. And so I'm curious about that, about is there a possibility for catharsis in your work um, or, or if you experience that, um, can you not go back? Can you not go back? Hmm. 
Um, hmm. Is there the possibility of catharsis? Yes. <laughs> yes. It's not, it doesn't always happen in every series, but yes. But it's, you know, one of the first times that I used language in my practice is a series I ended a long time ago, but it was the first time language showed up was when I was in grad school and I was making work about race and identity and it was grad school kind of work, but the critiques that I was getting were um, much more about my peer group trying to understand something about my racial identity than it was about critiquing the work. Mm. For instance, so one of the works I got, but the responses I got was maybe if you make it into a slave ship, then I would get that it's about race or I don't know. I just can't critique this work because I don't see race, something like that. In order not to make a um, hundred little slave ships so that I could be understood in a, in a way that was not true to my way of making, um, I started to write that language, what people were asking me over and over and over again. And it's not the first time, it's not the hundredth time. Sometimes it's the thousandth time that you write it and deconstruct it and call it white noise, which is what I did. And then um, transform that language. Started off as like, there's something wrong here, but I can't, I don't have a response by the thousandth, thousandth time. Oh, I know. I understand what you were intending to ask me. I know what my response would be next time I hear this question. And also I can make this much more beautiful. I can make fields of snowy kind of clusters out of the question, do people ever, um, don't you think your work is a little elitist? That question, I can make that beautiful. But the catharsis is the struggle with it. You know, catharsis sounds so, it's the relief of it, but it's actually, to get to the relief, it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of work. Yeah. It's a lot of labor intensive repetition in order to divorce the original meaning from the text and then undergo some sort of transformation through the body. So I don't, I don't, you know, every text doesn't make it into the work. There are contronyms that I will never make work about because there's, there's no poetry in them. I mentioned quiddity is my favorite. Dollop is also a contronym. It means a little of something, a lot of something. That's not poetic. That's like that sour cream commercial. There's no poetry in there. There's no potential for catharsis there. It's not worthy of the labor. But when it is, you know, with the tragedies and the epics and the smaller text, then then it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. My favorite contronym is cleave. Yes. To separate and to bring together. It makes no sense. <laughs> it makes no sense. But I, I feel like um, it makes sense at the same time. Yeah. It's a good one. It's a good one. There's poetry. That's not dollop a daisy. There's poetry here. <laughs> Next time I'll say dollop. <laughs> well, Bethany, thank you so much for, for speaking for such a long time with me about your work. And congratulations again with on your show and your show at the Peabody Essex. And everyone, um, you have a couple more weeks to go see this. So go tomorrow um, and see her work. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank, thank you both um, so much for, for this dialogue today. Um, it's just been brilliant. Um, so we encourage anyone, if you have a question, feel free to put it um, in the chat or you can also um, raise your hand, um, but I'll go to uh, GE first for the first question. Go ahead, GE. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you, Bethany. And I also want to say, just from watching through the screen here, what a beautiful installation. I mean, of 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 this this whole show, or these actual the two shows, but just the way they're beautiful. I was wondering, as much as your work of sort of meshing together, sort of sense and no sense, not nonsense, but no sense. Um, you know, it's activating something for us. Um. Is working with these various incongruities um, as much a sort of reach for repair? Mm. I can't, 
there's something hopeful about repair that I, I mean, in my life, I hope for repair in my practice. I don't know if that's my chief concern, unless you're thinking of it in a different way than I am. What's I've seen hope- your chats and there's a lot of linguistic um, deconstruction happening there. So maybe you're defining it in a different way. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking of almost as the um, as the term of tickum oum, you know, of kind of the overall kind of repair culturally and spiritually, you know, that might be going on. But that's where I was going. I can't say that today. Um, is there? Hmm. No, I think I'm still in the phase of pointing out of witnessing and pointing out which feels like the precursor to repair uh, I don't think I'm there yet I don't think the work is there yet thank you thank you thank you GE so much um, for that that question um excuse the office phone <laughs> um yeah again if anybody else has a question please feel free to um put it in the chat um and I'll ask one um to give folks a little bit more time um I'm thinking so much about Renee Gladwin's um work in in looking at at yours and um I just wonder if you're like engaging um if, if you've engaged with with the like artist space show of hers um which I think is doing obviously similar things in terms of maybe like embellishing and then obliterating language or um, kind of this, like taking a part of language and taking a part of um, knowing, right? Um, and knowledge. And I, um, but I do think you both seem to treat the the page differently. Um, like there's a, maybe um you hold on to the 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 page or that detritus a little bit more and I wonder with her work if there's maybe more of like a freedom from it or an independence like that kind of um there's a rejection of the of the page but those are just my kind of thoughts I don't even know if you're familiar with the work but I'd I'd wonder if yeah I've seen Im- a few images um and they're beautiful I think the work that you know, I always know that I love a work when it makes me jealous. And so artists who, by the end of all that laboring, either don't hold on to the necessity of language or that they never needed it. Like there's something linguistic about Cy Twombly and Agnes Martin. And there's no, sometimes there's language there, but oftentimes there is not. And yet it feels like it's still grappling with language, even when it's not present or has been cycled through so many times that it becomes something other than other than the legible linguistic. That work always makes me jealous. And that's how I know it's really, there's something in there that I'm longing for. Um, yeah, but I haven't moved, I haven't moved beyond the necessity of it yet. And that's probably not true because the old ship works have no language in them. And yet they still feel related to everything else. So maybe that's not true. Maybe that's where I am heading. It's so interesting. Yeah, thank you. Um, so if there are no further uh, questions today from anyone, um, I'm really happy to uh, turn it over to our concluding um, poetry reading for the day. Here at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a reading, and we have um, Riel Bello here with us. Um, Riel Bello is a Metis storyteller, visual artist, and radio host. They were raised between Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Chiapas, Mexico. Riel holds a BA from Pitzer and an MFA from the Milton Avery School of the Arts, and she is usually on the move. Thank you so much, Riel, for being here. I'll turn it to you. Um, Anthony, hello. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm going to talk kind of quickly because I have just a few minutes and there's a few things I want to get through. Um, Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much for um, inviting me as a part of the rail programming. Thank you for that beautiful talk, Bethany, and for sharing your work. That was really awesome. Um, And yeah, okay, no more ups and ends. Um, I guess I just wanted to say that uh, we live in an interconnected world, both in a global capitalism kind of way and a Wakatoan kind of way and a Buddhism kind of way, and maybe these are not separate ways, 
And so as an Inanu person and in constant relationship with all beings, it is my obligation that today, on the 51st day that Palestine has been bombed and devastated and the lives of over 20,000 martyrs have been taken at the hands of the settler colonial states of Israel and the United States, that we call for an immediate and enduring ceasefire and the return of all Palestinian lands to the Palestinian people. Um, I urge us all to remember that decolonization is not a metaphor, that decolonization is always more than acknowledgement and necessitates that all stolen lands and wealth be returned to indigenous stewardship. So in this moment, I'm asking us to imagine a Palestine that is not only free, but thriving and abundant with trees and birds and children, and that this is the future we are stepping into, and that this is what we must hold in our minds and our hearts if we are to move towards it. So please heed the call that is being asked of you and respond as you're able. We must change the ways that we relate to each other, to the earth, Performative solidarity statements are bare minimum. I hope we can get there. We must risk our privilege and power and step into the vulnerability of liberation. So with that, I wanted to read a brief poem of my own and a few poems from my teachers. Just wave at me, Carolyn, if I'm getting too close to the end of the line. Uh, and I'll try and slow down a little bit. <laughs> this is just a brief excerpt from a manuscript that I'm working on, the first part will respond, uh, repeats itself with all these little blurbs. I muster a feeling that I am born of a field of love. After that, perhaps, this something thrown in front of me, decipher the landing of a foot and perhaps walking is faith in a habit of falling that a leg falls into. I lift my foot and fall until I remember to fall, to fall, to fall again. We fall. We fall when there is something to find on the bottom, on the bottom, on the bottom arises in this finding. This time, my eyes are caught in the pedal in the middle of murk, and this moment stains me gold and black and silver sands caught in the gutter. By rain and braiding slowly, as the clouds stretch a flock of green parrots watching from my shoulder atop the palm on the lawn where I cower, I muster a feeling that I am born of a field of love after that. And so, this next thing is from We Left Them Nothing by Demian Diniazzi. We must collectively stop imagining apocalypse or future world of dystopia. We must stop imagining destruction, oil fields, deforestation, cages, animal displacement, surveillance, and future genocide. We must stop giving away these ideas because they result in the perpetual construction of our own prisons. We must stop doing this imagining for the sake of subversive prophecy. It results in capitalist appropriation, simulated delusion, environmental destruction, gender violence, erasure, and death. We must stop predicting apocalypses and fascist governmental hierarchies on behalf of post-colonial psychosis and power-hungry hetero heteropatriarchal degenerates. You don't know how violated we have felt in our own country. You don't know how language has been used as warfare in the ancestral territories of our people. You don't know how silenced we've been in the ancestral realms of our people. You don't know how much violence we've endured in the ancestral soil of our people. You don't know how much shame you've placed on us among the ancestral croplands of our people. You don't know how manipulated we've been surrounded by the ancestral waterways of our people. You don't know how unloved we felt among the ancestral homelands of our people. And you don't know how much hate you've confronted. We've moved freely as we have through the lands once cared for by our people. 
You don't know how much disrespect our ancestors have endured under the ancestral skies that have nurtured our people. You don't know how inappropriate and offensive it is to expect us to have to prove anything to you in the ancestral lands of our people. And because of this, you don't know how much indestructible joy exists within our tribes as we resist your uncivilized concept of a country. This next one is from uh, The River of History by Gloria Bird. Beginning. Writing of this singular moment that is disconcertingly a part of everything else. Voices speak through the night as abstract as joining the hamburger line in the McDonald's drive through Miraculous as covering a vast expanse of land in a short period of time and as vacuous as a cowboy bar dancing. I want to speak of history that does not repeat itself and that used up paradigm I would rather not believe in but have learned to face each time I am accosted by the truth. At the death of an old friend, for instance, or when I am forced to confront the abuse of children in schools set aside for their education by those entrusted with those young unbreakable spirits rooted deep in the signifiable wilderness where heartache is used to define us. In this cosmetized Western Pueblo of Indian artifact scandals, the ironic heroes are not real people after all. In an ordinary day's time, I am hauling water again too close to Los Alamos to regard the tap safe. I am at a stoplight, car engine idling when the howling begins. It enters the car window carried on wind. I do not want to hear voices, but must allow them to express their distress to enter the space where I am solid, a solitary witness. For in that one liberating gesture, perhaps healing will follow. It is a beginning identifying the submerged pain, written in Espanola, New Mexico in 1993. And I'm going to finish with the first poem in Diane Burns is one chapbook of poetry writing the one-eyed Ford. It's called, Our People. Our people slit open the badger to see the tomorrows in its blood. Now, Look at me and see what our tomorrows hold. We lie together, souls slit, open, raw, and bleeding. We embrace and rub the wounds together. Thank you for your time. Wow, Riel, thank you so, so much. Um, just stunning, thank you for that reading. Um, and thank you, Bethany and Amanda, so much for your conversation today as well. Um, here at The Rail, we also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSC program and making these daily conversations possible and for their support of our growing archive, which you can view on The Rail's YouTube channel. Today's conversation has been recorded and will be up there shortly. Um, help keep The Rail free. We are fundraising uh, $200,000 this season to directly support our writers, guest artists, production staff, and operations for the coming year. As a small nonprofit, we need your support. Donate at the link in the chat to help us meet our goal. And join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a poetry reading curated by Sophia Tarazawa, featuring Tarazawa, Sylvia Chan, Fatima Ayan, Malika Hirsi, Arya Pahari, and Leah uh, Tiger. And you can now um, turn on your uh, microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much for today. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you, that was such a beautiful thank you, reading. Thank you thank so much. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Riel. Thank you, Amanda. Powerful reading. Thank you for the thank questions, you. everyone. Thank you, Bethany. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, Amanda. Beautiful show.